Live from Franklin, Tennessee, at the legendary Sound Kitchen Studios, I'm Seth Mosley. We're on the Full Circle Music Show here with our live Music Makers Bootcamp audience. Yeah. So, we've got Tom Lonnie, Mike Payne, Chad Segura, and Zach Kelm. Thank you guys for being here. Really quick, I just want to hear what your guys' journey was into the music industry. Maybe just give us a you know, brief snippet background so our audience can kind of get a little context for who you are, what you've done. Don't be humble. You know, feel free to brag, and if you worked on Rich Mullen's record, tell him. You know? We're all interested to know that. So why don't you start us off, Tom? Okay, my name is Tom Lonnie, and I started really in a small town in Nebraska where there was no opportunity whatsoever to get into the music industry. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. I was playing in bands and played electric bass in several different bands. And I decided I wanted to get into the technical side and try to do engineering and producing. So it was really quite an amazing experience because I spent about a year and a half researching colleges and trying to figure out where I would go. I'll never forget, one of the places I went was in upstate New York. It was a college called Fredonia State University, and they had a big recording school there. And I went up there to audition to get in, and they put me in front of a, now I know, MCI JH636 console with a JH24 24-track 2-inch, and they had me wanted me to mix a song from scratch, and I knew nothing at all. I didn't even know what the play button was on the multi-track. So I was just like going, oh my gosh, I'm in way over my head here. And I said, how would you expect me to know how to do all of this if I'm just now coming to audition to even go to this school? And they said, well, maybe your dad owned a recording studio. That was the guy's answer, which I was like, uh, I don't <laughs> think so. So anyways, I did not end up going there. I ended up going to Memphis State University. And where my real break came was there's a great recording school there, but I got an internship at a studio called Ardent Recordings in Memphis. And they've been around for 50 some years. And produced some major, major records. Led Zeppelin III was cut there, all the ZZ Top records. In fact, Afterburner, I was there for, and I was there for the end of Eliminator and got to hang out with those guys. Gin Blossoms, absolutely. I mean, I did a bunch of Alex Chilton records, so that's where Big Star got their start. And I did a record with R.E.M. at Ardent. It was the green record. But Anyways, long story short is my break was getting an internship there and then just doing everything I possibly could do to impress the people there, to let me get into a control room, let me get in on a session, let me watch what was really going on. And I just can't tell you how formative that was for me was to watch real sessions happening and just being able to be a fly on the wall and eventually work up to assistant. And that's really how I got my start. And I know that's really not the way it works now. This was a long time ago. This was in 1984, before half of you guys were born. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't know. There's not really a formula. But I will say this. It was a while ago. Like 20 years ago, I was mixing a record, and there was an intern who was in his final internship at a university. And he was not even interested in coming in the control room whatsoever. He was just sitting on the couch, reading Mix Magazine all day. And I went out to him, and I said... So let me ask you a question. If you blow this internship and this studio doesn't give you an opportunity to work here, where else are you going to go after that? What's your next step? What's your next move? And the guy just looked at me with a blank stare on his face. Basically, if you have any kind of an opportunity whatsoever, you need to do everything humanly possible to maximize that opportunity. So that's a little bit of a background. Very cool. Very cool. Tom Lonnie, how about Mike Payne? I'm from Rockford, Illinois, originally. That's the uh, Cubs. Go Cubs. Oh. I had a band in high school, wrote some songs and played guitar and sang. Came down here to Nashville originally to finish up my schooling. I ended up going to Belmont for two years. Once I got out, I just kind of tried to latch on to, like Tom said, any opportunity that I could get. I got a call from a band that just got a record deal, so I ended up moving to Atlanta for a couple of years. That band ended up kind of dissolving. Came back, started to do some touring. I had a couple good friends from college that were at the time working for a management company. 
And I went on the road with a couple, two or three different country acts, actually, to start out with. Basically, that led to other opportunities to perform live and to travel. And then I met a guy named Ian Esklin in about 2002, great songwriter and his producer as well. He and I kind of struck up a friendship. Basically, he ended up getting a publishing deal with Brentwood Benson Music Publishing. And he phoned me up one day shortly after signing his deal and said, hey, I've been writing all these songs and I need to get them demoed. And would you come play guitar on the demos? And of course, I was like, you know, I about jumped out of my chair, right? I would say that was my break. That's when I sort of discovered the love for recording and the process, the creative process in production and part creation and producing and things like that. That's yeah. my break. But. Very cool. We share in common that Ian Esklin was also the guy that brought me to Nashville. That's right. So we should probably have had him be here just to like <laughs> moderate this whole panel. Yeah. Just so both you and I can like thank him anyway. So. Seriously, I know, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's Mike Payne. How about Chad Segura? I grew up in Salem, Oregon, which is a hotbed of music. So not really. But yeah, you know, I mean, I think music gets all of us to this town. I did what you did. I mean, I came here for school. I had heard about Belmont. And I actually went somewhere local, you know, a state school for a couple years there and realized that studying music at a state school is awesome. Sorry for anybody who did. But it just for me, it was like, you know, I was a vocal performance major, so you can only sing so many Italian arias before you shoot yourself in the head. Um, so I transferred out to Belmont as a vocal performance major in commercial music. I thought, this is going to be great. First week in, I'm testing to figure out which ear training class I'm going to be in and which theory class and all these things. And I was like, oh, I forgot I hate this. So it was like, this sucks all joy out of music for me. And there were people all around me that were loving it. They were like giddy. So I luckily happened to go to a school that had a music business program because I was in the early days of that. And so I switched during orientation week to music business and have not ever looked back. As part of that, I interned at what is now Capital, but it was EMI. It was actually Sparrow at the time. Loved that. I had a split internship. I had an internship there and an internship at a publisher. And I thought publishing is what I wanted to get into, but my publishing internship sucked. On the label side, it was amazing. I loved it. I was getting pulled into things and involved in all kinds of things. They were taking me to business lunches and I was doing projects and it was great. So when I graduated, they reached out about a job and they said, okay, hey, do you know anything about publicity? And I was like, no, but I will take it. And I quickly determined that there are people like his wife that are brilliant at that and people like me that suck. That is actually where I first met his wife. We worked alongside each other and I was the assistant for that team for a season and determined this was not my thing. So I moved from there. My boss went to marketing. I moved to marketing. I liked that a little bit better. Still didn't like scratch the itch for me. And about two years into that process, I had an opportunity to go to publishing and I thought, man, I'll give this another shot in this place. Let's see what this is like. And man, I mean, that was the thing it locked in. For me, I'm super ADD, so it's like publishing is great because you can be working on worship and then you can be working on radio stuff and you can be working on film and TV stuff and you can do, you're jumping all over the place if you want to. And to echo what Tom said, I mean, that, the whole deal there was definitely about just get in and do whatever I could. I did that in the internship, but definitely even in my job, when I got that part figured out a little bit, I'd be like, hey, would you need help with that? Do you need help with this? And eventually, that kind of led to me heading up that team. And so, rest is history. I've been in a couple, few different places prior to Centricity. But yeah, publishing is my thing. It's all about songs. It's all about the creative process. And I love it. And I get to work with guys like this who make my job so much easier and so much more enjoyable. So. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks, Chad. Yeah. Zach Kelm. So, what I do is the career I never knew I wanted which is really funny. I backed into this career. I think there was a divine purpose in it, but I actually was a camp kid. If any of you have ever heard of Canicut camps, I was a Canicut counselor who went to college so that I could someday work for Canicut full time. And while I was at school, because of my background in working with my parents in event promotions, the college I went to used concerts as their orientation, career day, and different things like that. And they said, hey, you have a background in this, you might be good at it. And I said, okay. 
And from there, I fell in love with it. I started as a college promoter and just found that I loved it and was good at it. And almost immediately, people started asking me, you know, what are you going to do after college? And I kept saying to them, I'm going to go be a camp counselor. And they kept looking at me like, well, why are you doing this? I was like, well, I just, I really enjoy it. And so I did that for four years and it became very evident to me, or I suppose to others first and then to me later that I wasn't supposed to be a camp counselor and that I needed to be doing something in this field. But I actually, I grew up in a small town in Missouri, a country town. I didn't even realize there was a music business. I loved music. I wasn't a kid that liked one particular genre. I remember when Thriller came out and I thought it was amazing. I remember when Garth Brooks, The Dance came out and that was my jam for a few years. I just loved all music. I just didn't know there was an industry around it. It never dawned on me. So there I'm in college, get asked to start promoting shows and it just clicked. And four years later of doing that, people here starting offering me jobs. And the last show I did was with an Australian man who managed his daughter and his whole family traveled with him. And he came up to me somewhere during the day and he said, hey, I hear you're moving to Nashville. And I said, yeah. He said, well, what are you doing? And I said, I have a few job opportunities and I'm going to go pursue them. And he said, well, come see me. And Long story short, I've worked for him for five and a half years, and his daughter was Rebecca St. James, and his sons are now for King and Country, and became part of their family, and just had a great five and a half years with them. And then I started my own company, Q Management, in 2002. And a very cool note, which you won't know yet, you might know, but I turned in a license request for a song that Seth and one of my artists did for the Super Bowl in two weeks. So we will see. You don't know that they're going to take it, but it did get used last week on the AFC Championship game. So we might hear a song with Seth Mosley's name on it in the Super Bowl in a couple weeks. Well, there we go. So really, honestly, you've got a power-packed group of industry professionals who have been at it for a long time. How long, you know, would you say you spent in the music business? 29 years. 29 years, 29 Mike. Years, Mike, yeah. what about you? I'm right at about 20. Okay, so 20. Chad, you're 20? 21 in March. Yeah. 21. Yeah, I'm around the same. Around 20, yeah. so 60. You have a total of combined about 90 years of combined music industry experience. How many people think that's a pretty valuable thing? So your job now is to take advantage of that. They're here because they want to add value to you, and they're here out of the generosity of their own hearts. The reason why we do this boot camp is because we want to shed the light on opening the mystery of what's behind the music business. How do you get into it? Like Tom said, there's no formulas granted. Nobody's going to say, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, you're going to be a star, although we all want that. This is your chance to ask them, and chances are you'll relate to at least one of them because we had a musician, a producer, a publisher, and a manager. So this is your opportunity to ask them questions. So we'll just open it up to you guys. Don't be shy. Go for it. I'm Jerry Fee, Boise, Idaho, transplant to Nashville. As an artist who is not on a label, touring independently is very difficult, but it's being done. Is there ever a chance where someone can either buy onto or get the attention of people that are booking bigger tours mm -hmm to try and grow the audience and to get a part of something better than what you can do independently? Yeah, there is. I don't know if today that's the best use of your money. You know, it's just, it's hard to cut through all the noise right now. And let's say you were going to jump on someone's tour and they said, well, it'll cost you 15 grand. You'd probably be better served in grinding it out in your local area and creating it that way than you are to jump on. Not that I'm saying that that goes across the board. If it was the biggest tour of the fall and somehow you had a relationship and they said, hey, we'd just love to take you, you know, you're going to have to pay for a bunk or whatever, by all means, do that. But many times those same slots are going to be given to artists that are already signed, already at radio, and they're paying to be on that tour. So I'm not saying that if you got that opportunity, don't run with it, run with it. But I don't know that I would spend a whole ton of cash like that at that stage to jump on a tour like that. You know, so if you can figure out how to do that locally, what I would say to do is develop the relationships locally with those clubs and those different venues that people are coming through with and try to be that local that gets added to those shows. And that happens. I used to do it, literally. I used to add a local college group to almost every show that came in. So, 
I would add too, and this is not in that because that's absolutely his field. In the radio space, another thing that often gets asked by independent artists is, hey, should I hire you know, a promoter and take a single to radio? That also is a great way to set money on fire. So it's one of those things. You can hire even the same people that we use as independents outside of our own staff in-house. And for the station that picks it up, that'll be great. But once again, there are a lot of ways to get your music out there. And sometimes those things like buying onto a tour, if you don't really have all the other support behind it or doing it radio, is more of a vanity thing than actually good business. So, yeah. At what point does somebody need a manager in the process of being an artist? When does that happen? What does the manager do for you? So from an artistic standpoint, like you're an artist and you want to know or you know someone that's an artist. Know, or, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it kind of really depends on what's happening. I don't think you need a manager necessarily just as an independent artist, but that kind of depends on where you're at. I mean, how many dates are you doing? And have you signed a publishing deal, you know, by chance? And that's bringing you different opportunities. A manager can certainly help you, but you would want to be further along into your career and your processes before you jumped in and grabbed a manager and then that was suddenly going to solve a bunch of things. Today we're in a, what I would say is a pull kind of society, not a push society. So when things are really working, there's a vacuum that kind of is created. Everybody has, you know, all 100 million things happening at once. So the idea that, you know, we can just push out a bunch of things that suddenly are going to gravitate doesn't work as much anymore. That's why you see things pull through on social so quickly. If it's sticky, then it's going to start working. And when something starts to really work like that, that's when you would want to grab another relationship that maybe can help you manage whatever that is that's happening. But aside from something like that really happening, then you're probably giving away some money that you probably need for yourself at that point and maybe is not really going to help you. But if, let's say, for instance, you've put together your own album and you've had it recorded and you're already out touring and you're seeing a real uptick every market you go in and you keep hearing feedback from your fans that this one particular song is really working, if things like that start adding up and it becomes apparent, I think I've got something happening here and everywhere I go, I'm seeing when I repeat, I'm up 20%. Well, then a manager can help you kind of put some things into place and maybe introduce some other relationships that might be able to you know, pick that to the next level. But aside from it being very evident that there's some things really working and some metrics that are really going in the right direction, that's not really necessarily going to help you. So in the flow of the music business mm -hmm. where you've got the label and you've got the right. artist and you've got the manager. Where does the manager fit in that timeline? It can happen in a hundred different ways. Honestly, I've taken acts to labels and got them signed. I've had labels call me and say, Hey, I've got this act I've developed. I'm really looking for the right manager before we launch it. I've had labels or publishers or, you know, other bands call me and say, Hey, I saw this local band out in Seattle and, you got to check them out. It can happen many different ways, but usually the common denominator is that there is some level of momentum already happening. That doesn't mean a manager can't take an act that they see something in and start connecting some dots and make some things happen. That can happen, but usually the ones that are really going to work, there's some level of momentum already happening. Okay, thank yeah. You. Yeah. I, I like what you said there about the push versus the pull. Yeah. Chad, you could back me up on this, but I think we're seeing that trend happening even in radio. It's not uncommon right now to see a single get really hot on Spotify or YouTube for that matter, and months later turn into a radio single. So, Tom, coming from the producer end of the spectrum, is there value in having management? Or is that not so much a thing? I, I would say, just to echo what these guys are saying, and that you have to really get to a critical mass where that is the next step that makes sense. I generally don't see that as happening like in early stages, you know, from a production standpoint. I would typically not find an artist, develop them, and then go, the next thing you need is a manager before we go to some other avenue of promoting sure. the, the band. Sure, good answer. This has to do with marketing. My name is Justin. I'm from Orlando. Maybe expound upon what you're saying about, I don't know if you were saying you can hire into the label, but not being a part of the label. If you have a release 
And let's say you are playing in your city, but you kind of want to go bigger than your city. I see a lot of artists get stuck in their city. Maybe they have a few thousand dollars and they want to throw it maybe at some radio or something. Is that possible? Like what's the best avenue for marketing? So within labels, labels usually have a team of radio promoters that are on staff, but then we also utilize independents that are outside that anybody can hire. And those are the ones that I would be referring to. Independents out there, you pay a fee for them and they will, for a specific period of time, work your song to a particular format. And that's the stuff that I think can be super dangerous. You can do it and they'll work it, but they may be working 15 other things or whatever at the time. So they included it in their call, but you're, you know, number 12 on the list as far as priority. But that said, there are ways that you can utilize and you can build a team outside of the label structure because the labels are not the only way to go. You can have extremely successful, more successful financially, in many cases, careers as an independent artist, just because you're not feeding a big machine. But you can hire people like Zach's wife, Velvet has a uh, publicity company that they're phenomenal. It's the same kind of thing. You can hire publicists. You can basically have a team that functions as your label. It's just a matter of once again, and you're going to hear this a lot and it's going to sound like we're broken records. I'll explain what a record is to half of you <laughs> at, at some point. But the thing is, is that it really is all about momentum. You have to have something going on in every one of these cases. And that's the hardest thing. It's that catch 22. I know that's the frustration because you go, well, yeah, how do I get to the point where I'm doing it and a lot of it is just man get out there you know call around start expanding outside your own little local area as far as touring you know book dates around kind of expand that space and it builds you know people do here same thing for a publisher i'm not just looking for a random song every once in a while i'll hear a song and i'll say that's amazing and i might do a single song deal with them but same thing you have to kind of build to a place where there's something happening and we're going to go yeah there's something going on with that person so it's true in all of our areas, but it really is just about, you have to stretch yourself, you know? And if you're not good at doing that stuff, then find a buddy or someone that is, that can help book you into some of those places and you cut them in on part of it or whatever in that space. I put that money into a rehearsal space, a 15 passenger van and a trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So for a label, like let's just say you have an artist and you're ready to push a big release. Yeah. What's like the first steps you guys take? Do people even contact magazines anymore to do write-ups? I know Facebook ads is a big thing, but as far as just marketing, how do you guys think about it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not the expert in this space. I mean, we do a little bit of it. My thing's all about song, but I do know obviously that has changed a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a holistic, you're kind of gonna look in a lot of different areas at once when you're launching something. So that will be, publicity on one side and social media on another side and marketing promotions and retail and rate, you kind of have to hit it all. So I don't know that there's like one thing that you could do to just go, okay, I'm gonna pour everything in here and that's gonna necessarily, think about it, we all get to the end of the day and we're just like, golly, and then tomorrow's coming, right? And so we all do that no matter what it is that we're doing, every day goes by so fast and then wait, 2016's over. And so you're constantly fighting against the 24-hour news cycles and all the busyness that smartphones and social media and everything has brought to all of our lives. So I don't think today there's necessarily just one thing you can do. You're kind of hitting everything, and then you can start seeing where things start to gravitate and catch hold, and you can kind of push you know, a little gasoline there as that happens. You're going to cover your bases, and then you know, Seth and I have an artist that we worked with that we started seeing quickly sync started happening on a particular single we put out. And so I was putting all of my focus into, in that particular launch up to that album, into making sure all of those bases were covered. We had lots of those conversations in trying to make sure that that could go as far as it could. It unlocked a whole lot of things. So I saw an opportunity, it presented itself, we chased it down, that opportunity then led to NFL and other things. And so. We were covering all the bases in the beginning, and then one thing raised its hand, and I could see where that was going. So we kept doing all the other things, but I put a lot of focus in trying to expound that, and in the end, it worked. So I don't know that there's necessarily just one thing you could do. My name's Tom. I live here in Nashville. Um, there's a plethora of do's 
like do take vocal lessons, do attend things like this if you want to, you know, succeed. But what you don't hear a lot of is what are the don'ts? Like what are those landmines that you see a lot of artists step on? What are a lot of those, you know, major mistakes that you've seen that new artists can learn from? Let's make it even broader. What are some of the don'ts for anybody in the music industry? Don't burn bridges. I will say that. There's, there's something because you just don't, you never know. All our lives intersect and interweave in so many different ways all the time. I got a lot of grace for people. I tend to like most everybody, but there's a very short list of people that I just won't do work with because I've been burned too many times. So that's a key thing. Also, there's a fine line between being persistent and being freaking annoying, you know? And we all have so much stuff to do. So if you're pitching stuff to anybody here and saying, hey, work with me, here's my stuff, you know, trust us, we'll get back to you when we can. It's hard enough to, with the people that we work with professionally to interact and hear and do all those kind of things. So yeah, there's that balance of, yes, be persistent. Don't just, you know, assume, well, I sent it in, you know, two years ago. It's weird that I've never heard back, but don't call us every week or, you know, email us or whatever. Yeah. Tom, after 29 years in the music business, could you look back and identify, maybe this is another way to rephrase the question a little bit, but I always love to think about things in terms of what were the things I wish I would have known before I jumped into this thing? And being in it for 29 years, I can imagine. Okay, that's a good question, Seth. I would say the big thing for me is that I wish I would have known to always navigate in a way that you're trying to add value or bring something to somebody rather than trying to get something from somebody. You know, everybody who I ended up really gravitating towards and working with was somebody who would approach me in a way that said, okay, for a while I had a label called Tar and Feather Records and I had three artists on it. And I would always gravitate towards people who were like, hey, how can I bring value to what you're doing? It's a mindset shift, really. And I want to help those people, basically. I want to help those people if they're coming to me looking to see how they can help in whatever I'm doing or add value to what I'm doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah. Let's camp there for a second. What, I wish I would have known what? I wish I would have known fill in the blank when you jumped in. I'll jump in. There was an intern one time that I had, and this went on for like three months, and eventually... I set this intern down and I just said, hey, I've just noticed that when I'm here, you seem to like try to act busy, but I'm hearing from the rest of the staff when I'm not here, you don't. And I don't understand that. Let me get inside your head. What's happening? He's like, well, at the end of the day, I took this internship because I thought that I was going to be working directly with you. And of course, I didn't even interview him, so I didn't know. And I said, oh, well, I wish, number one, you would have said something because I would have tried to, in some ways, give you some more time. But let me just say this to you. If you get an opportunity, just do anything and everything you can in that opportunity. And I'm sure at some point, someone in my office would have said, golly, this intern's killing it, and X, Y, and Z. So this particular person ended up staying on a little bit longer. And as time went on, because of that, I tried to get to know him a little bit better and try to help in any way I could. And I noticed that he seemed to want to try to position himself to know more and know more people than he actually did. And he started acting like he was already a manager and he was already managing artists and he already had all the relationships that he needed. And on the day he was leaving, I said, hey, I think you've got a lot of talent. And I did mean that. I said, but a word of caution to you would be, don't try to present yourself at knowing more than you actually do or knowing more people than you actually do. Because there's a lot of people I don't know and there's a lot of things I actually don't know. And I learn things new almost seems like every day. And I think people at the end of the day like to work with people that don't act like they know it all and don't try to present themselves to be more than they are. So. One thing I wouldn't do is I wouldn't act like you know more than you actually do and know more people than you actually know. It's just a real turnoff. And so I actually played out a hypothetical with him. I said, okay, you're the manager. You're going to walk in to say Capitol Records LA. 
and you're going to be asked to sit down with the president of that label and they're going to say, what's your plan? What's your plan? And I watched the blood drain. I said, because they're going to want to know that they're involved with an artist that has a manager that has some clue, don't have to know everything, but at least knows some of the things that needs to happen. And if you've acted like you know those things and you know all those people, when you're actually given that opportunity, you'll blow it because you won't actually know those things and you won't actually know those people. So that's something that came to mind. Yeah. I wish I would have known how to keep a guitar in tune. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's actually true. But um, no, I think I say that because don't hesitate to ask good questions and to you know, partner with other professionals. And it goes back to that collaboration piece that you were kind of touching on, Tom. I think when I first started out, to get serious for a second, I think I was a bit more after it for what I could get out of it instead of what I can give to the project. It is a shift in your mentality, but I feel like it's so important. And as I've made that shift, I approach it totally different. It's like I'm excited to go work on this new thing because I can offer more value and more expertise. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I would not underestimate is the value of understanding how to be a good hang. I don't know how to put it in a different way, but just knowing to how it. to chill, when it's appropriate to ask a question, how to be a fly on the wall, those types of skills are not often taught, but you definitely don't want somebody in a control room or in a session that is going to be you know, up in the grill of the artist's face, for example. That would be just like you would be gone the next day if you did something like that. And so just, again, this is such a broad audience. I don't even know how many people want to do producing or engineering or any of the stuff I did, but I would just say learn how to hang out and kind of chill. I guess a good word to people being artists too, though. Yeah. Hi, my name is Giovanni. I just have a question for people that are independent artists and they're trying to figure out how to get themselves out there without themselves actually doing it in a way. I don't know how to explain it. People that don't like putting themselves out there and bragging and boasting and like, hey, look what I can do. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. What do you say to that? Are there any other alternatives to that? Or do you have to just bite the bullet and get uncomfortable and just put yourself out there? I actually struggled with that when I first came to town because this wasn't something that I planned to do, but I can't imagine doing anything different now. So I would see managers that, I mean, every time I would run into them, they were just telling me, they were hyping me, just tell me how great this and how great that and their artists are doing this and they're about to play, you know, whatever, whatever the late night show was at that time. And, and it just went against everything in me. Everything in me was like, I just can't do that. I just can't be that. I can't be that hype guy that's always up, 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 up. But what I figured out is my job is to do that. I just have to be able to live in my own skin and do it at the same time. So I had to figure out within my own person how I could promote my artists, how I could you know, make sure and take advantage of particular opportunities, and yet still be who I am and not go to bed at night and be like, gosh, I just sold my soul. And the way it was for me is it was about relationships. So for me, just developing relationships, whether it was the, you know, whomever it was. And I just found that as I did that and lived within who I am, then people would, when I would talk to them about whatever that opportunity was, they didn't go, here he comes again. It was like, okay, you know what? I know that guy. We have a relationship. If he's saying that, I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to check that out or whatever the opportunity was. So you're right. Any artist has got to be able to do that in some way. You'll have to figure out how to do that. But there is a way to do it without you being always the hype guy. Yeah, yeah, but every manager, every artist is a hustler in some yeah, form or fashion yeah, yeah. because it's just you have to be. So. Yeah, I was just going to say, you do, there's a certain point you just suck it up and yeah. you just do it and you go, hey, this is, I mean, look, Seth has to do it. There's a promotion thing in what we do. He wants to be busy making records and doing other things and doing this, creating this, but he has to do it. We all do. I mean, I don't think there's anybody on this panel, anyone up here that is a natural, just like, 
hype person that, that that's what we do. We have basically done it by necessity. You learn how to do it, but you do it in that real way. One of the things that I remember at Belmont, I remember everyone's like, you know, talking, all the professors, everyone was hyping or talking up the fact that, man, it's all about networking and networking. The people around you are going to do it, you know, and schmoozing, basically, which has a horrible connotation to it, as it should, really, at its core. When you're doing something, this is the theme, but when you're doing something to try and get something from somebody, and it's not a legitimate relationship, it's not any of those things, people can see through that stuff. So what I realized, though, to Zach's point was I hated that. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And it took me a while into my actual career to finally realize, oh, I'm actually doing it. It's just in a way that doesn't make me feel sick. It's not a natural thing for most creatives in general. That's not a thing. Every once in a while, somebody just lines up and you just are like, man, you are perfect at it. And they even know the right level of hype and they can do it. But for most, it is just a forced thing. It's the same way that you force yourself in a situation to, man, go talk to that person, that that's hard to do. But you kind of have to do it. It's the same with going out and booking the shows. It's the same with all those things. You've got to force yourself out of the comfort zone. That's what separates you from the masses out there that are not here, that don't have their butts in the seats here, yeah. you know, and haven't taken the time and put the money and the time and effort into coming here to learn this stuff. One thing I'd add to that is that as you continue to do it, it'll get more natural sure. too. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, a binary, you're either terrible or great. You know, there's a linear progression on that. So I would just say, take small steps, work towards it. Well, what would you guys say would be like the first steps to getting your feet wet and getting more comfortable in that sort of space? And Use social media, but in just in your way. So it doesn't feel super hypey. You're not saying this is the, you know, yeah, exactly. I, that Most killer really track that you've yeah. ever, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like that is noise to people. They yeah, don't even exactly, know what to yeah. do. If you share it in an honest way, man, I'm just excited about this. I just got to do this. I got to be part of this. I wanted to share it with all my friends on Facebook. I wanted to, you know, share it with my friends on Instagram, whatever. Do If you do it in a way that feels more like you are trying to give them something, hey, thought you might enjoy it. You're not telling them to buy it. You're not doing any of those things. They're going to naturally respond. They're going to go stream it or buy it or do something if they love it. Time for one more. I'm Shelly, and I'm a songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Shelly. So tall, I can't see you through. <laughs> so I'm one of 11,000 here in Nashville, and i like a little advice how to not annoy a publisher, but be able to professionally submit something. Yeah. So that said, you do have to be able to put yourself out there. As we keep yeah. saying, it's that balance. It's that thing. Some of the biggest songs that I've gotten to be part of, just been blessed to be a part of, are songs that came in like that. And it was just a one-off or that I heard somebody do. I heard somebody record it or whatever, some indie artist or whatever. I'm like, this is a great song. And they're like, yeah, it's the one I didn't write. It's this thing. You know? And so then you go find the person that wrote it. And sometimes those are, you know, a lot of people have that song in them you know, maybe one. But then there are those ones that are like, no, I want to do this. This is the thing. You can hook us. You can get our attention with a song if it's brilliant. You know, I talked about this the other night with some of you, so forgive me. But I don't need good songs. I literally have like piles and piles of them that will never probably ever be heard again. I don't even really need great songs. I'll take them because sometimes those get cut. But really, I need phenomenal songs. I need things that are going to stand out to the point to where, it, you know, whether it's the producer or the manager or the label or whoever, when I send it to them, when they hear it, they're like, oh, my gosh, my artist has to do this. Or, you know, maybe with some tweaking, you know, and they jump on the song and it's going to be there. But that's the only way you cut through the noise. Otherwise, for us, we hear them all the time. I mean, I hear lots of really good songs. and I'm like, yeah, that's great. Keep doing that. So... I think if you get to the point where, hey, I've got something that I think is really, really special, don't send me, you know, 18 songs that, you, you know what I mean? That, that it's like, uh, okay, and track, you know, 12 was the one that you're really excited about. Send me just one or maybe two, maybe three, if you're really excited about it. So, I mean, that, there are ways to get to us. We don't tend to like to take unsolicited music, but part of you coming here for this is we're opening ourselves up to some of that. You know, and if you're here, then that's a different thing for me. For you to be able to say, "Hey, I met you at Seth's boot camp. Here's this. You said I could send you a song. Great. We'll take a listen." So, yeah. 
Can I ask a question along those lines? Yeah. How important for you is the quality of the demo? Oh, man, that's a great question. And we talked about that too. If it's a killer, like a really just a good, clean quality piano vocal or guitar vocal, great. You know, at the end of the day, granted in the pop realm, track is definitely part of the, the whole thing. But ultimately, in its most technical sense, a song is lyric and melody. Those are the two pieces. If I can hear them, and if they're both great and they work well together, awesome. Now on the flip side, if you send me something that like I can barely even hear and I can't tell what you're saying and there's no lyric, that isn't going to do anything for you. I'm not going to lie, a great, well-produced demo is going to get my attention. That said, we talk about turd polishing here, you know, and you can make something sound really great and it'll even fool us sometimes. We're like, man, this sounds great. And then after a while you start listening to it and you're like, that's really not a great song, but the production is amazing. That said, I don't want you guys spending a ton of money on, you know, doing something that is probably still going to not get on our radar. So at the end of the day, great song trumps everything. But if it's a great song and it's really well produced, that's the sweet spot. It's been awesome having our panelists, Seth Mosley, live here, Music Makers Boot Camp. Let's give a nice round of applause for Tom Lonnie, Mike Payne, Chad Segura, and Zach Kelly. <laughs> Hi, this is Seth Mosley. You've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. If you haven't already done so, head over to fullcirclegoeslive.com to get on the waiting list for our upcoming Music Makers Boot Camp. Don't miss your spot. If you sign up there, you get priority access to the first tickets as soon as they become available. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jericho Scroggins. We will see you on the next episode.